All right, hello. Merry Spookmas to anyone that may or may not be here. We are going to read 
some creepy pastas as we did last year, except I didn't read it with him. I read it with that one British guy I know. Yes, you re you read it with Langton. Yes, but he's he's busy as of late. So and yes, and this guy is likes creepy pastas. So he is the second in command this year. Yes, and I'm not Langton. All right, so checking the voice. Dude. Yeah, okay. So, let me get the music going. The spooky music. For with to set the mood. It's the same playlist from last year. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay, so... What shall we start with? Let me check the list. You know, what could be fun is, uh... There's some websites where you put items in, and it just spins a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could work. Um, you know any of those? Yeah, let me pull one up real quick. I used it once when I was doing, like, a variety stream. I had it bookmarked. It's perfect. Great. Uh, there we go. Oh, and actually, let me make sure that your audio is being pumped into the right channel. Oh, it actually, I might not be... Oh god, I might have forgot some. Let me see. I might not be recording channel 4. I need to fix that. <laughs> if they can't hear me, it's no great loss. No, you should be in channel 1 too, but... I'm just... I might not be recording it. Oh, yep, I'm, see. Yep, I'm not. <laughs> Alright, so, if anybody's watching this in the future, I went down because I had to add his audio thing back. Okay, so, uh, this is, this is too loud, this is kind of distracting. Can I turn this down on my end? I think you can. Where is my audio cable? There it is. Yeah, can't hear myself think. So anyway, let me put this up on the way. Let me put this up on the screen. Or maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. I think it would be fun if you put it on the screen. Although, where, I'm not sure of. <laughs> that works. <laughs> oh, they got to see my bookmark bar. Now all my deepest secrets are revealed. Google.com slash Princess Peach feet. No! <laughs> I'll just, I'll put it right here and then we'll just toggle it when we need it right okay so our options are yes no yes no yes no no but it's a uh, <laughs> abandoned by disney only the greatest on this channel Cry Baby Lane. We we have we have some questionable ones, but we have some good ones in there too. <laughs> the Danny Phantom Lost episode. <laughs> Plankton that got I, served. The Danny Phantom one I recall as being particularly bad. 
suicide mouse. And also, I mean, I have like a little mature content warning, but if you're watching this and, you know, you're maybe not in the best spot to hear about some of these topics, then uh, I advise you do not listen. Yeah, don't listen, but you can still watch. Escape from Mary Wood. Well, I mean, I don't know what you're going to get out of it if you do. Uh, Pin Pal. Princess. Rap Rat. You, and, uh, and then finally, Red Mist. Are you wanting to do a, another long form one? Uh, I mean, I don't want to do anything too long if I can help it, but. Pen, if we do all six parts of Pen Pal, that's going to be pretty long. Hmm. Um. It's not super long, but. Well, you know what? We'll it'll it'll for now probably we'll let, be. For now, we'll let fate decide. Right. If we but, do land on it, it'll probably be comparable to 1999. All right. Blank. All right. So let's see what we get. I'm so excited. We got. The Danny Phantom Lost episode. <laughs> oh, and it, it cuts off the little thing there, but that's okay. Oh, we're oh. off to a great start. <laughs> yeah, we're starting strong tonight. <laughs> okay, so let me look it up. like the lost episodes are almost cheating really because that's just a well of is it the danny phantom bacon murder mystery i don't think so <laughs> well because that's the first result i got and i'm <laughs> i see i see i'm not going to tell you how i found the lost episode vhs it's irrelevant danny phantom's disheveled eyes are crying you want your corn it was danny phantom's dad dad phantom you're a fucking liar son uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might be it. This <laughs> is maybe. Okay, well, should should we go with this? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll put it up. We'll we'll see. Uh, <laughs> I feel like this has got to be bad on purpose because you don't write a title like that. That it, pro it probably is. Anyway, I'll, I'll read it. I'll, I'll read it anyway. I'll do it. <laughs> In my search, I've also found this. Which you can or cannot add to the wheel at your discretion. Oh, that... I mean, I like the title card. Yeah. <laughs> the title card kind of sells it, if you ask me. Okay, so we got a new one. Insanity. So, uh, I'll remove Danny Phantom from the wheel since it got picked. Right. Alright, so do you have it? Do you have it open? I do not have it open. Yeah, because you're gonna you're gonna probably want to have it open. Uh can you send me the link? Oh wait, my hang on. My my playlist is <laughs> wrecked. I need to repair it. Oh dear. Hmm. I did not foresee this. What happened? <laughs> Some of my music broke. <laughs> oh. Because I, like, must have changed folders or something. Oh, here, I'll, yeah. I'll, re I'll repair some of it real quick. I mean, nobody, nobody's here at the moment, so... It's not like it's a huge deal, but... I think, I think the one viewer is me. <laughs>
I, I just pinged Blob, Jazio, and Ron. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if my brazen tactics work. <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. I pro I don't really have time to fix all of this, but I'll get at least some of it back up. I have a plugin that tries to automatically fix it, but it didn't seem to work. Clearly not. <laughs> Okay. So let me send you the link. You know, yes. just in case, just in case I need you to read some of it, which I might. I'm sure it's full of dialogue. Okay, so here we go. Danny Phantom, the truth, the light, everything moral, everything spiritual. I don't want to spoil this one, but at the end of this one, I am the ghost. His parents are ghost hunters, and he is the ghost. The twist of this one is that he actually isn't a ghost, but suffers from schizophrenia, and his parents don't love him, nor do they hunt ghosts. They are concerned about his behavior. You have to be what you are. Even if you have the worst story in the world, you are you. Even if no one is listening, even if the world is horrible and nothing is of value, you are you. That's shockingly relevant. Yeah. <laughs> All the horror of the world is people trying to be something they are not, like me. I started life as a retro game reviewer, and I ended as someone who reviewing shows he's never watched. I was too old, the plots were transparent. Well, I mean, yeah, that's one of his powers. Something else, something invisible, something amorphous. HELP ME! <laughs> And yeah, I'm not going to tell you how I found the lost episode VHS. It's irrelevant. Danny Phantom's disheveled eyes are crying. You want your corn? It was Danny Phantom's dad. Dad Phantom. You're a fucking liar, son. His father, Father Phantom, kicked him out. Danny Phantom was homeless and a ghost. <laughs> Danny Phantom thought he was invisible and thought he would sneak into the fridge to get some bacon. Read that one. You know we can see you, asshole. It was the father, disheveled as all hell, pointing a gun at his son. Touch my bacon and I'll send you back to the Stone Age. And I'm not talking about the Flintstones. <laughs> he cocked the gun. Not anything related to penises. <laughs> it's an expression <laughs> for pulling the hair trigger back, making the murder shot much easier. He was going to murder his son for stealing bacon. Danny Phantom put a pacifier in his mouth and began to lay in a crib and cry. Yeah, it's, this has got to be bad on purpose. No, it definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to feel really bad if it's not, though. He assumed the fetal position and cried tears of sadness, the warmest, most comfortable tears. You're not a ghost, son. His father pointed the gun. But I'm about to make you one. His son reached for the bacon, and his father shot him in the skull. It was disturbing. The animation clipped, and Danny Phantom was shown with a bullet wound in his head, blood pouring down. Though his father started having sex with an American flag, and Danny Phantom lay there, foaming at the mouth. I was an intern for Nick Nick Nickelodeon, obviously. That's who I've always been. You have to be what you are, his father chortled. As the corpse of Danny Phantom was lowered into the soil, it's, it was a funeral, and no one was there because nobody loved Danny Phantom, not even his family. His father was there, thought, urinating on his son's grave. <laughs> Cops arrived and asked him what was going on. He informed him that he was merely watering the flowers, and he was issued a citation for gardening in a public space. <laughs> his father pulled down his pants and began to take a shit on his son's grave. You want your fucking corn bacon thief? <laughs> Evidently, his father claimed that Danny Phantom was coming at him with a knife and actually stabbed himself in the chest to provide evidence. An officer approaches him again and asks him why he's shitting on his son's grave. He informs the man that it's custom fertilizer and the cops detain him. 
he insists that his son's a ghost and that once you write it, you can never unwrite it, and his son, Danny Phantom, is alive and well. The officers demand to know the circumstances of the bacon murder, and eventually his father confesses that Danny Phantom is in the room with them right now, and that he's a ghost. The camera just shows nothing, nobody, just some asshole father drinking an ecto cooler with some shitty Ghostbusters proton pack he purchased at a bed, bath, and beyond for $9.99 in the 1980s. His father goes to trial for the murder of his son, and the trial is like the next 15 minutes of the, quote, VHS tape, unquote, <laughs> whatever those are. His father is naked in the courtroom, and the bailiff grabs him, cuffs him, and drags him to the back room. Oh no, you're going to the back room, son. <laughs> he returns to the courtroom with a black eye, but he's still completely naked. The judge orders him to put some clothes on. He opens up a fanny pack he had wrapped around his nude body that contains the corpse of Danny Phantom, which he had made into beef jerky. This is not a restrictive clause, it includes everyone. <laughs> After a 2,000 hour trial and examinations and cross-examinations, the jury finds him not guilty. The lawyer showed various pictures of Danny Phantom enjoying bacon, stealing bacon, demanding his father give him bacon until his father just had just fucking enough, had enough. <laughs> this, this resulted in a hung jury, and that's not what you think it means. The jury had killed itself. Go watch your no. Danny Phantom- oh, sorry. Go watch your Danny Phantom in hell, you piece of shit. <laughs> it was the judge who sentenced Father Phantom to the death penalty. He was subsequently held in a maximum security prison until he received lethal injection in his testicles and died an extremely painful death. Where it turns out Danny Phantom was a ghost. Not really though. You just see his father squirming, crying as the judge demanded lethal injection and Father Phantom was sentenced to death. For his last meal, he requested bacon. He insisted his son was a ghost, but that didn't excuse anything. There are no ghosts. Nobody dies. There is no beginning and end. His wife is crying in the viewing chamber as his father is injected with a lethal mix of pinto barbital and mondo fruit squeezers. He is naked for some reason. Ghosts don't exist. It's in your mind. Nothing has ever existed. Everything is in your mind. If you turn your eyes too far to the left, the entire sensory experience will cease to, cease to exist, and you are dead. Not a ghost, though. During his father's funeral, various people attended. Various school bullies who hated Danny Phantom for pretending he was a ghost to hide the fact his brother beat the shit out of him and murdered him over bacon. No, no, sorry, his bother. I was about to say, Dan Danny Phantom doesn't have a brother. He was giving a stand- now. <laughs> no, he is a bother. Oh, that's true. He's giving a standing ovation by the football club, a club dedicated to football. The pig skin was just... is it... I'm oh, sorry. The pig skin, a family pastime of kicking and running and demanding field goals. <laughs> I thought I saw a ghost in the background the last 30 month... 30 second... I'm oh, sorry, I was just checking the chat. Uh, he was giving a... yeah, yeah, I already go that. I thought I saw a ghost in the background in the last 30 seconds. A ghost? Danny Phantom? No, it was just some discarded dish rags and a pile of shitty newspapers. The newspaper, s s the newspaper says fake paranormal father kills son for pretending he is a ghost and stealing bacon. What was most disturbing and what scared me the most was the date of the newspaper and the accompanying image. The date was 9-11-2001 and the image was of your parents having sex. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> also, uh, uh he hello, Zeal. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, um, I, I didn't have the ch I had the chat minimized, I couldn't see it. We're off to a great start. Absolutely fabulous. That's the only purposefully bad one that I've suggested. Yeah. Um, ooh. Anyway, time to pick the next. Is that... Is that like tinted dark or is that just my screen? Is what tinted dark? The the wheel. It looks the same to me? Okay. It might just be my screen, I don't know. Okay. Whatever. Who cares?
Okay. Plankton got served is the next one. And I gotta put the... I gotta put the image up. So I hate to do this as your co-host, but since this one doesn't have any dialogue, I'm going to make a quick trip to the men's room. Alright. I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, so let me see here. Put the photo up. There we go. All right. Let me ch and let me change the text. Oh no! Don't do that. I love editing text. Alright, so here we go. I'm sure many have heard of Lost Episode Creepypastas. They are usually an incredibly graphic episode that conveys such fear for children that it was never aired, though someone managed to sneak a viewing or owns one of the tapes. The most popular example of this is Squidward's Suicide, in which Squidward commits suicide, hence the title. Of course, all of these creepypastas are false. Yet, I remember a Spongebob episode that was altered heavily, but still remains in circulation today. This is One Course Meal, from Season 7. In the episode, Mr. Krabs finds out Plankton is horrified of whales and uses it to his advantage. This is one of the least popular episodes of the show due to the dark nature of the episode, even after the episode was heavily altered. Now how would I know, or no, now how would I have seen this episode before it was edited? It's simple, really. This is one of the seven Spongebob episodes that was revealed on the internet before it aired on TV. Always a big fan of the show, I was excited of the idea of having a Spongebob episode premiere on the internet before television. I rapidly re reloaded the Nick page, and finally the episode came up. It was known as Plankton Got Served, though it was eventually changed. Most of the episode is identical to the one that is circulated today. Plankton manages to break into the Krusty Krab. Oh, thank you for the follow. Plankton manages to break into the Krusty Krab and ties up Mr. Krabs and SpongeBob. As he is about to finally get the secret formula from SpongeBob, Mr. Krabs' daughter, Pearl, walks in. This terrifies Plankton and causes him to run out. Plankton later claims his ancestors were eaten by whales and that is why he fears them so. Mr. Krabs realizes this fear that Plankton has and decides to use it against him. He dresses up as his daughter and begins to follow Plankton around, frightening him. Plankton decides he can no longer take it and decides to make the ultimate decision. Plankton decides to commit suicide. Yes, this is still in the show today. You are free to watch it. Actually correct. <laughs> Plankton waits for the bus as he lies in the street waiting to get run over. That's when Spongebob comes over to try and convince him to continue his existence. This is where the alteration in the two versions begins. Plankton fails to heed Spongebob's word and remains there. In the altered version that was shown, Spongebob tells Plankton that it was Mr. Krabs' pearl the entire time, and he gets up. In another altered version, Spongebob says the same things, but Plankton refuses to believe him. Spongebob decides that the only thing he can do to show him the truth is to drag Mr. Krabs outside. Soon after he leaves, the typical red bus comes speeding along. Plankton sits up and watches it hit him as everything fades to darkness. Plankton finds himself, finds himself standing on a single platform overlooking darkness. In the darkness, he sees whales all looking up at him. There are members of his family he can faintly make out, calling for him to jump down. Plankton looks above and sees a light, a light he can scarcely believe. This would seem to represent heaven and hell. Plankton, resigned to his fate, jumps and plunges down into darkness. This is when the episode ends, and the traditional ep credits for the show are shown, parallel to Plankton's descent into the darkness. 
Now, some of you may say you saw the sh show as soon as it came available online. Apparently not fast enough. After seeing the episode online, I reloaded the page to find the altered version shown on the website. I kept reloading, curious of how I had seen the first version. The only answer I can imagine for my viewing of the original episode was that the creators uploaded the wrong file, and moments after uploading it recognized such. I may be the only one who saw this version. I truly do not know the sick ambitions the creators of Spongebob had in mind with this episode. Why would a kid's show portray death? Why would a kid's show portray heaven and hell? You know, it's not as weird as you'd think. Tom and Jerry did it all the time. Granted, I mean, you could argue it's maybe not like kids, kids, you know, you, you know. Nonetheless, the unaltered version is impossible to find. I searched as hard as I can, and I have failed to find anything legitimate about the episode I had seen. People had told me that I had seen only the altered version, and they were too surprised of the dark themes portrayed in the episode. Oh, they too were surprised. Sorry, I, I mess up a little bit sometimes. Nonetheless, I know what I saw. I know people would fail to believe me. People will accuse me of just trying to scare people. People will say I have no evidence. There are no photos. There is no busy video evidence of this occurrence. I only saw it once, and it never occurred to me to do such. I know the truth, and I want other people to know as well. Maybe, maybe, someone out there saw this episode as well, and can confirm it. Until then, I hope you enjoyed reading about my experience. Wait, Plankton has a family of whales, or did I mishear something? No, I, I think there was like, there's the whales and there's his family, like they're two separate entities in this story. Well, I mean, that, that was a pretty short one. And honestly, the creepypasta elements were surprisingly understated. Like, most of that is just in the episode. Like, the main difference is, obviously, the Plankton actually dies, whereas in the show, that doesn't happen. But, you know, most of that is just an actual episode that they aired on Nickelodeon. Like, everything up until he actually dies is real. That, that's just a real episode. Anyway, back to the wheel. I need to make my chat smaller. My chat's too big. No hyper-realistic bleeding eyes. Yeah, it was, it was surprisingly understated. I'll give it that. Okay, so let's spin the wheel. A torture device for the modern age. All right, what do we got? What do we got? Crybaby Lane. Okie doke. Oh. <laughs> Don't need that no more. Oh, we're going back. We're going back to Nickelodeon. Can I get this image? It's on like a uh, breeze wiki. Okay, let me let me turn this off. Turn the redirector off. Like, I got like a thing for a fandom wiki. Where's the? Where do you? How do you get the image? There, there is an image here. Oh, okay, here we go. Just gotta use Goog Goog Im Goog Image. There we go. Let me change the text. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. We read uh, Plankton Got Served, and it is fairly short. Right. Anyway, we're gonna we're doing Cry Baby Lane now. So, I don't think there's many 
Well, no, there's some there's some dialogue lower down. So we can uh trade off. I've got data. it pulled up. Alright. Alright. In 1999, I was 22 and I had just graduated from Emerson University in downtown Boston, majoring in screenwriting, specifically in cartoons and children's programming. My debt was pretty bad, so when Nickelodeon Studios offered me an internship at the studio in California, I accepted immediately. I jumped at the chance to get away from the dead-end job at Benjamin Franklin Tour Guide. Many of you asked to see Crybaby Lane, but if you want to see the original Crybaby Lane, you never will. Surprising. <laughs> Even if Nickelodeon somehow consents to releasing it to you, you won't be seeing what was shown on TV, and you sure as fuck won't be seeing the original that... How, how do you say that? L Lauer? I think so. Lauer. What's funny about this one is that they did re-air it at some point. <laughs> so, anyway, continue. I, I love how many of these are just like... You know, oh, it, it, it's a real thing, but you didn't see the real version. Right. <laughs> Only I saw that. I don't even think Nickelodeon has the original cut of the movie anymore. And if they do, it's in only backup copies. If the backup copies exist, they must be locked away in some vault, along with all the deleted episodes of Ren and Stimpy, and the never-before-mentioned episodes of SpongeBob SquarePants. You know, just throw it in there with Squidward's suicide and, uh, Stimpy gouges his own eyes out. <laughs> Granted, he did that on the show normally, I'm sure. That's not, yeah. a, cre that's not a creepypasta, that just happened. Honestly, nothing you could come up with for a creepypasta would be as weird as, as what was actually on Ren and Stimpy. Like, like, Ren pulls out his own nerve endings at one point. Like, you could not- you can't top that. Alright, anyway. Oh, and then the first line of the next paragraph. Anyway, I was hired in 1999, and immediately I was put on creative production team, put on a creative production team for the movie Cry Baby Lane. It would be almost a year before the movie was due to be broadcast. All in all, it was a pretty low effort kind of thing. There were only four people on the creative team, and I was the only steady one. Lauer would replace them on a whim. He said it was to keep it fresh. I thought it was because he was hiding something, and I was right. We had little over a year to make a made-for-TV movie. Not just to write it and cast it, but to film it and get it edited. Lauer didn't work fast at all. After the first three weeks, we only had ideas for the first 15 minutes of an 85-minute movie. Lauer, even at this point, was a weirdo. He was tall and lanky, and he carried himself awkwardly. He stuttered when he talked, and sometimes, when you were hunched over a piece of paper during those endless brainstorming sessions, you'd look up and you'd catch him staring at you, smiling. He'd look away when you caught his eye, and I guess that was the creepiest part. He always looked like he had something to hide. The brainstorm sessions, at first, were alright. We got the premise of it down pat. Two brothers unleash a demon and they get into mischief trying to get everything back to normal. Not exactly daytime Emmy stuff, but you know, it was an alright start. I thought the movie should be goofy and spooky, kind of like a Courage the Cowardly Dog kind of deal. As if Courage the Cowardly Dog was not the most terrifying thing you could possibly show to a child. Anyway. Right. Uh, Return the slap. However, from the very beginning... The <laughs> however, from the very beginning, Lauer made it clear that he wanted a film... want the film to be as scary as possible. He didn't want it to be cheap thrills with a good wholesome ending. He wanted to push it farther than Are You Afraid of the Dark ever dreamed of. And I guess he did. It was about three weeks into production when I first noticed something. Lauer had the absolute power of persuasion over everyone else in the creative production team. No one fought him, and by the third week, he was already suggesting some morbid things. I remember he said he wanted the little brother to die halfway through the movie, getting hit with a dump truck. I immediately shot it down. I was the only one who said anything, and it stayed that way until I left the studio entirely and never came back. At first, cannibalism and other fucked up shit was kept to jokes and tasteless comments, but as time went on, it became more and more overt. I'd give him an idea, which most of the time he would end up using, like, how about the movie starts with a morbid undertaker who reads them stories, to which he'd reply, yeah, and yeah. then he could cut them up into little pieces and force feed them to his dog. He made those jokes a few times in the early stages, then he got serious. He'd stand up like he was Jesus or something, clear his throat loudly, and proclaim his idea. I'd be the only one to shoot it down. 
every fucking time. One day, near the end of our brainstorming sessions, Lauer cleared his voice and stood up. We all fell silent and looked at him, like we normally would. He stood up and said, Gentlemen and females, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> females, this dude... This dude's an incel. <laughs> I remember what he did. He paused and looked right at me, and as he said, The story will revolve around the legend of a pair of Siamese twins. Have you ever heard of the Donner Party? Everyone nodded except for me. I didn't like where the conversation was going. They ate themselves when it got cold. They ate each other. Everyone nodded again. I closed my eyes. What would Siamese twins do if they had nothing to eat? Would one wait until the other twin dies, then consume her own sister's flesh? Would they claw, claw out each other's eyes until one of them died, then dine upon them like a vulture tearing at the skin of a dead deer? I do not know. It is interesting indeed. I didn't know what the fuck I was hearing. I opened my eyes and looked around the room. No one was fucking moving. Everyone's eyes were on Lauer except for mine, and when I looked at him, he was still staring at me. Children like violence. They revel in it. Children like to be scared. So we'll scare them, won't we, Johnny? He leaned over the table, getting pretty damn close to my face. His breath smelled like decaying shit. I stared back That's at him. That's just coffee breath. I, I stared back at him. Uh, you can. How about you read his dialogue? Like, uh, the... The, the narrator? Yeah. I was gonna read Lauer's, but... Oh, yeah, that, that, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're fucked up, to be honest. He smiled, and then backed away. Oh, I'm fucked up, all right. But you have to be fucked up to survive in this cutthroat world. His grin expanded. Literally. Right now... I'm going to show you some pictures that will spark some of your imaginations. He got up and locked the door from the inside. I stood up and said, What the fuck are you doing? Let's not make any errors in judgment, Jonathan. Sit down. No. Sit. For some reason, I did. Lauer pulled out one of those shitty overhead projectors. He turned on the switch and he speak shouted in an unusually high and semi-frantic voice. This is the fucking news that we need to continue with this pro fucking duction. This is what every child should see. His eyes bulged in his head. He put the image down on the glass surface of the overhead. It was silent. The image was in black and white, but it was grainy. I could vaguely make out a boy lying on a brick floor. His arms cut off and his bloody little nub black dots. The only thing that was clear was his face. He was bleeding from the mouth. Lauer almost threw the paper off the overhead, slamming down another one. It was a zoomed in shot of the boy's face. It was in color. The blood trickled from his open mouth onto the brick floor. His eyes shut, grimy blood underneath his eyebrows and eyelashes. Then his eyes opened and I screamed. No one else in the fucking room did and it died in infancy, the shrillness ringing in the air. The, pupil, the pupils were completely black, the rest of the eye was normal. The longer I stared, the more the eyes moved, widening and widening until it looked like the skin above his eyebrows and eye sockets was going to rip in half. Then they started to bleed. Blood started as a trickle, and I swear to God I could hear it. More. Now like it, it was like a full-blown stream. More. More until the blick I cannot talk. Let me take a sip. <laughs> More until the brick on the floor was a lake of blood. I could hear it like I was hiking and I came across, across a stream and now I could smell the kid. I could fucking smell his rot. I leaned underneath the table and vomited. When I rose back up, the images were gone. Everyone else in the room was expressionless. L Lauer turned on the lights. You may go. He said, unlocking the door. I walked through those fucking doors, and I never came back. This happened near the end of the brainstorming process, and by the time I left, the casting was done and the script was almost fully written. They were desperately behind schedule. I think Lauer planned it that way, so there wouldn't be time for proper editing. I never watched the real thing when it aired, but I heard from a friend who was working at the editing department that they had to cut a good 15 to 20 minutes of disturbing footage from the film before it was fit to be released, and it was only fit to be released. They didn't have enough time to check the footage frame by frame. 
I guess he got his wish unless they cut every single scene that had the pictures in them. Every child watching Crybaby Lane has an unconscious memory of those pictures and I weep for them, I really do. They fucked me up and as I write this to you, it'll, it will be the last thing I'll ever write before I slit my throat and blood before blood splatters all over this fucking computer screen. There's something I should tell you first though. Early on, Lauer posed the idea of the two brothers capturing a squirrel, putting said squirrel in a jar, and slowly drowning it before filling the jar with sand and dropping it to the bottom of a pond. Soon after this was suggested, Sandy appeared in SpongeBob SquarePants' Tea at the Tree Dome. Lauer also suggested, in one scene of the movie, for a man with a squid-like squid -like nose, nose. <laughs> to take off his pants in front of the two boys and... I, I'm not saying that. I'm not reading that. that. That'll get like your video removed from from YouTube. I'm sure you can imagine though. Off camera, but heavily implied, Squidward soon after appeared as a major character in SpongeBob SquarePants. It was suggested that the two be stepbrothers forced to live in the same house after the first one's mom was found dead in a shallow grave, her body heavily cannibalized by her own husband, a local weatherman. A show with the vaguely premise, Drake and Josh, started in 2004, and the stepfather is indeed a weatherman. Lauer also suggested the younger brother have a doghouse in which he keeps various animal fetuses encased in acid that he regularly uses to poison his mother to have sex with his abusive stepfather, as told by Ginger debuted soon after. Um, I, I'm not sure I get the connection for that one, but I didn't really watch as told by Ginger, so... Neither did I. <laughs> just two, two unrelated facts, it turns out. I yes. just, just felt like mentioning it. <laughs> a man who captures the souls of children in a vacuum cleaner and sends them to Hades, Danny Phantom. A robot who goes insane on the two brothers, kills one of them, wears his skin, pretending to be the dead brother at high school, my life as a teenage robot. The list goes on and on. Nickelodeon knows, and they're continuing the legacy of Lauer, sometimes subtly, and sometimes overtly. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. Do you want to see it? You got it. Uh, there's a, there's a video here, but I'm kind of not sure I should play it. <laughs> it's the full movie. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the full movie? Yeah. Oh. Well, then I, now I'm especially not sure I should play it. Okay, well, that one, that one was something. It had a lot of cursing in it, I'll tell you that much. A lot of, a lot of stuff was in that one. Uh, some spicy content. Yep, oh, no, that's not the right, that's not the right tab. Did we, we lose, go. uh, Shaded Zeal? Oh, uh, we might have. Blob said he might join if we go for long enough. Oh, princess. Now oh, this... did you see? Did you see the other two I sent? Uh, no, I didn't. It, oh, it was uh. Oh uh, yeah, I was honestly thinking about putting Dead Bart on there. I don't. I don't think I did that one last year. I don't believe so. The strangest security tape I've ever seen is also interesting. Okay, well, I added it, but first, uh... Whatever we don't get to, we can, uh... We can do next year. <laughs> yeah. Or we can do a sequel stream on the 31st, and then really nobody will show up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was I was a little bit afraid because, that I wouldn't find this one, because I, I know there's another creepypasta that has to do with a princess, like a more literal princess, but no, I found it, okay. I'm proud of you. Thanks. Okay, so let me send it your way. Is there dialogue? I don't know. But, let me, let me see. There, if there is... Okay, there's a, there's a bit of it. Okay. I will be prepared. Okay. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what to do, because, like, in the ones where there's no dialogue, I just figured, you know, we'd swap out on paragraphs, but, you know, you can't really tell without reading a little bit into it. Right. 
Anyway, let me... I gotta change the text. Alright. Did I send it to you? Yeah, I did. Okay. Ever wondered if things can just be born evil? In this enlightened age of ours, concepts like good and evil are often painted as outmoded, archaic even. According to modern thought, people, animals too obviously, are simply products of their environment and no more responsible for their actions than a twig in the stream. But I know better. Some things are just born bad. About ten years ago, we had a German shepherd named Duchess that had a litter of puppies, seven in all. Six looked like any other shepherd you've ever seen. The seventh was a snowy white. Not a true albino, just white furred with a black nose and blue eyes. There was never any doubt about which one we were keeping out of that litter. We named her Princess. Before the end of six months, any plans we had about giving away or selling the others became a moot point, as all of the others were dead. We'd just find them at a rate of about one per month. Not mangled or anything, just dead as if they'd died in their sleep. At first, we thought maybe their mother... So, bleh, mother. My tongue's getting a little like... <laughs> That's part of it. <laughs> Do you want to trade off paragraphs? <laughs> I don't I don't think it's gonna get much better. Okay. <laughs> At first, we thought maybe their mother, it being her first litter and all, was accidentally crushing or smothering them. Later, we had no doubt as to what killed them. Within a year, she came to dominate her mother. Her father, tough old alpha that he was, and to a degree, us too. Her parents shied away from her. When we put out their food, she ate till her heart's content, unchallenged by the other two. Once I tried to shoo her away and let the other two eat, she snarled at me, bearing those perfect white fangs to her. I have never actually said this word out loud. How do you say this? In, 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 incongruously. Incongruously black gum, gums and losing a growl- loosing a growl so deep that I felt it in my guts more than I heard it. After that, I left her alone too. I've often wondered if the parents of serial killers know they have a monster in the making. I mean, sure, some of them are to blame for how their kids turn out. Products of fucked up households with systematic abuse of all possible flavors. But then there are ones that seem to be true aberrations. It's those families I'm curious about. Do they smile and laugh and pretend that everything's fine? I know that we sure did. We downplayed the weirdness around Princess. Tried to rationalize her behavior. The bizarre things she'd do, like killing rabbits and leaving them hung up in the bushes behind our house. Some dogs do that to show they- Oh, no, actually you should read that. Some dogs do that to show they love you. Cats too. My father would say. To them, it's just bringing you food. To me, it looked like she was taunting us. Just like the puppies years earlier, not one of those rabbits ever had a mark on it. Princess, just like her mom and dad, was well looked after and never hurt for a meal, so it wasn't as if she were hunting for food. Her innumerable kills were always untouched. No, the only thing I ever saw her eat was a kitten. We had some feral cats in the woods around our house, and one mama cat had a litter in our tool shed. Feral is really stretching it. Most of them were tame enough to be petted, this mama among them. I returned home from school one day and headed back around to look in on them. The door to the shed was open and inside I found Princess, her jaws pink from her feast. As she devoured that last kitten, her beautiful blue eyes never left mine. The mama we found displayed on what I'd come to think of as the rabbit bush. The tipping point came that same year when we found her sire dead. He was the best dog we'd ever had, that we will ever have. We woke one Saturday morning to find him in the backyard lying dead without a mark, like so many rabbits before him. I can count the number of times I ever saw my father cry on one hand. This was one of them. That was also how we found out how she killed so cleanly. She strangled her prey, like a jaguar. The fur at her father's neck was still wet with her saliva. We spent that morning burying that good old faithful dog, and then he sent me and my mom away on some pr some pretense. No words were spoken, but there was no doubt about what he intended to do. Uh, there's not as much dialogue as I thought. You want to switch off? 
Sure. Okay, you, you read this next one. <clears throat> uh, are we just gonna alternate? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure that there are some of you reading this that will find the notion of putting an animal down to be a dom ab abominable. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say abdominal. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that there are some of you reading this that will find the notion of putting an animal down to be abominable. But what other, what other options did he have, really? Take her to an animal shelter? Give her to some other family? Who could do that and go to sleep with a clear conscience? As it turned <laughs> out, we weren't getting any sleep that night, regardless of our decision. We spent that afternoon at my uncle's house. Once I came in from playing to get a glass of water, I overheard my mom telling my uncle that she sometimes wondered if the dog was possessed or something. I'd sometimes wonder the same thing. Later that evening, not before sunset, we got a call from Dad. Apparently the deed was done. By the time we arrived home, he'd already washed up and changed clothes. But there was little he could have done to hide his wounds, even less to hide the haunted look in his eyes. Both his arms and one leg were bandaged, and that was bad enough, but what stuck with me all these years later was just how terrified he looked. It wasn't until I'd actually been through combat that I recognized that expression. It's how men look after they've stared to death straight in the face. My father never talked about it, but he drafted a friend up from the street, a friend from up the street to come help, and it's from him that I get this part of the story. Princess was many things, bloodthirsty and ch evil chief among them, but stupid wasn't among them. In fact, it, if us. nothing else, <laughs> <laughs> but stupid wasn't among us. In that, if nothing else, she took after her father. Her dad, Rocky, was famous for letting himself into the house if it was storming out. He'd figure out how to paw open the sliding glass door out to the patio. What was really astounding is that he also had the presence of mind to close it behind him. Not being stupid, she knew something was up and made herself scarce, disappearing into the woods. Dad, not wanting to put this off and being in full-on revenge mode, called his friend from down the road and filled him in. So off on the hunt the two of them went. In his own words, she was she laying, was laying for, for us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, if it sounds absurd to say that Princess lay in ambush, then I've failed at conveying just how wrong everything about her truly was. She led them on a chase through those woods, barking whenever it seemed the stupid humans had lost her again. Then, she laid up beneath an overhang on the creek bank just where the path crossed it and waited. She was on my father the instant he stepped down the creek, grabbing his leg and making him fall head first into the water. Then she went straight for his throat. My dad had already lost his rifle at that point and he grabbed her with both hands to try and fend her off, wrestling with 115 pounds of teeth, claws and muscle in a foot and a half of water, Princess savaging his arms all the while. At some point he managed to work his legs up between him and the dog and kick her away from him, providing his friend with a clean shot of which he took, catching Princess through the chest. He put a second round through her head, point blank. He then helped my dad back home into the emergency room, telling him he'd go back to see after Princess once they got home. She can rot where she is, was all my dad had to say on that subject. After they got back from the hospital, our neighbor went back on his ATV to pick up Princess for burial. He was a dog lover like us, and it didn't seem right to him to just leave her. If he'd spent as much time tiptoeing around as we had, he might have felt differently. She flat wasn't there, he said. No blood trail. Nothing. He also said that, after he'd been there poking around for a few minutes, he noticed something else strange. No birds. It was dead quiet the way the woods sometimes get right before a bad storm blows in. Wisely, he got right the hell out of there. There was a storm coming, alright. That night, Duchess came pawing at the back door wanting in, 
something she'd never done once in all the time she'd been with us, and I had a dream. In it, I was playing football in the backyard with some buddies and ran over to where a bad throw had landed near Rocky's grave. As I reached for it, Princess's head shoved up out of the ground to grab my hand. I woke up with a jolt and was promptly scared out of roughly ten more years of life by the silhouette of a German shepherd in the hallway. Uh, sorry, I just like, ugh, that Coca-Cola was getting to me a little bit. <laughs> and I think, I think that one might have picked up, unfortunately, so I apologize for that. Uh, I didn't hear it, so... <laughs> you just outed yourself. <gasps> I, I, I tend to do that. I tend to apologize for burping more than anyone actually hears it. <laughs> it was Duchess, of course. She was sitting in the hallway, whining and wagging her tail nervously. She was looking back towards the front of the house. I walked over to her and placed my hand on her big doggy head and said, What is it, girl? That's when I heard the distinctive sound of claws on glass. Something was pawing at the patio door. Thoroughly terrified, I grabbed Duchess by the collar and dragged her along with me to my parents' room, shutting the door behind me. I was 14, I was terrified, but even in that terror, retreating to my parents' room wasn't just for the security, for the security of mommy and daddy. That's where the guns were. I woke them up and told them what I'd heard. Oh sweet Jesus, my mother Mom. said. Dad got up and locked the bedroom door and said, Y'all lock yourselves in the bathroom. I heard the patio door slide open. If any of the rest of us had any doubts about what had just come into the house, Duchess sure didn't. The only thing she'd ever fear feared in this world was her own pup. A deep rumble of a growl vibrated in the floor beneath our bare feet, and Duchess' bladder let go as if on cue. Mine wasn't far from doing the same. What followed was a six-hour exercise in pure terror, punctuated by snarling attacks on the bedroom door, crashes through the rest of the house as Princess found more things to break, whispered prayers from my mother, and litanies of curses from my father as another of his attempted forays out of the bedroom were thwarted. We were without a phone. The one on my parents' nightstand was dead. We'd later find the phone line to have been ripped out of the main box. My mom suggested that we try to make it to the car, and above and beyond everything else. It was my father's response to that idea that really scared me. Of the three of us, he was supposed to be the rational thinker, but what we got instead was... Honey, I think that's what it wants us to do. As though the world through the windows turned from black to gray, a quiet fell over the house. Mom and I watched through the windows, craning our heads in an attempt to get an eye on the patio door. But, try as we might, the best we could manage was a view of most of the patio. More than enough concealment for a dog to slink in or out, even a big one like Princess. After an hour of silence, my dad quietly opened the bedroom door. I remember thinking what a useless gesture any attempt at stealth was. Dog senses are so much more acute than ours that he might as well have fired a 21-gun salute. Dad stepped in the hallway and shooed me back to the bedroom. Don't come out until I say, okay? Carefully, he made his way through the house to the patio door. We heard him shut it before he shouted back to us to stay in the bedroom till he told us to come out. Through the door, I could hear him moving around and what seemed to be him dropping things into a garbage bag. After about 30 minutes, he gave us all the clear. What greeted us was a disaster. Ripped up cushions and pillows, destroyed furniture, shredded papers and books all over the floor. But most terrible were the smears of gore all over everything. My mother wondered aloud at what she'd drug into the house. Grim-faced, my father did not answer. He simply turned and headed out, to, out the back to bury Rocky for a second time. We cleaned up as best we could while Dad drove down to the neighbor's house to make all the appropriate calls. After all these years, I still wonder what portion of homeowner's insurance covers attack by undead demon ghost dog. Unspoken, we all wondered what the night would bring. As it turns out, we never got a repeat, but Duchess never left the house again. Time rolled on. Occasionally, we'd find a new present 
on the rabbit bush. Just a friendly reminder, another token of Princess's abiding love. About two years into college, my dad called to tell me that our neighbor had passed. Heart attack in his sleep, the coroner says, said my dad. But what we... <laughs> I don't know what accent that is. <laughs> coroner says, said my dad. But what we were both thinking was, not a mark. There are plenty of nights where I wonder what the last thing to pass before that old bachelor's eyes... Wait. Oh, what the last thing to pass was... The last thing was to pass before that old bachelor's eyes. I can guarantee you it stared right back. I've seen firsthand how it feeds. Not long after that, my folks put the house up for sale. I sort of acted as the go-between on that deal. About a week after the new owners moved in, I received a call from the man of the house. He wanted to know if we'd left any pets behind when we moved. Already fearing the answer, I asked him why he asked. Oh, me and the kids keep seeing this white shepherd in the woods. Pretty. Pretty. <laughs> okay, and that was that one. That was a pretty good one. Yeah, I, li I like it. I think it's uh, pretty fair. Yeah. Well-written ones are few and far between. Yep. You know, the old Sturgeon's Law or whatever. Okay, let's see, what next? Oh, it's Red Mist time. Oh boy. <laughs> Cer certainly not at all redundant. <laughs> you know what, just, just for laughs. I got I got a special picture I'm gonna put up. The one from the show. <laughs> okay, so let me see. No, this is a continuation of another story called Squidward's Suicide. <laughs> yeah, a continuation, they say. Okay. Red Mist is a contra- well, actually, is it- is this just a description of the pasta? Okay, I'm just gonna read it. Read it as is. Red Mist is a controversial real-life bootleg tape featuring an unaired episode of the popular Nickelodeon series SpongeBob SquarePants. Like the long-lost yet recently discovered Suicide Mouse tape, Red Mist was purportedly created by a now imprisoned Scottish animator for the series. Let me out! <laughs> for the series, who intended to pass the tape off as the season four premiere instead of fear of the. Fear of a Krabby Patty and feature the death of Squidward. Uh, I didn't I'm, do anything! I didn't do it! And even if I did, it's legal! <laughs> <laughs> Red Mist begins with Squidward preparing to practice his clarinet in his room as SpongeBob and Patrick play merrily outside. Squidward wraps his mouth around the clarinet and is only able to play one note before being interrupted by someone knocking. Oh, the oh let me read the dialogue in this one. I, I have a good like let me read a dial the dialogue that's coming up. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Uh he walks down and opens the door and discovers that a traveling salesman is at his door. The salesman, a Scottish fish, asks if he could have a moment of Squidward's time. Squidward tells him that he isn't interested, and slams the door in the man's face, walking back to his room. The salesman begins knocking again, and Squidward again opens the door angrily. The salesman, looking very upset, tells Squidward that... The red mist is coming! <laughs> ...and proceeds to walk off, confusing Squidward. Squidward walks back to his room and finally begins playing the clarinet. After performing several off-key notes, Spongebob and Patrick begin laughing outside, interrupting Squidward yet again. You should know, I, I think I peaked my mic four times doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Squidward walks over to the window and shouts at the two, telling them that he needs to practice for a concert he will be performing at. SpongeBob and Patrick both apologize tearfully and walk back to their respective houses. Squidward, unsure of himself, walks back and begins playing his clarinet again, this time uninterrupted. The scene then fades to red over the course of 12 seconds and, perhaps by glitch, the same scene is repeated once more, which is common, which is somewhat common in rough cuts of animation. However, this time Squidward's eyes have been replaced with more realistic eyes with red pupils, clearly, clearly not real but more realistic than CGI, TV, or animated. The audio is also completely absent from the scene save for occasional clicks. Uh, after the repeat of the previous scene, a new scene begins with the same red eyes, but at the theater where Squidward is playing his clarinet. The frames in the animation skip every four seconds, but the sound remains synced. After an unruly performance of a song he dubbed Red Mist, SpongeBob and Patrick are seen in the crowd booing Squidward, very uncommon for them. The scene pans to reveal the same Scottish salesman next to them, also booing. As Squidward walks back to his home with his head in his tentacles, what's odd is the scene actually shows him walking to his house with nothing happening in the background for 3 minutes and 50 seconds before abruptly cutting to red for another 20 seconds just as he arrives at his house. Uh, don't, don't read yet because there's a, there's a photo that I'm going to put up. There's a photo in the article, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> okay. A new scene appears, back to the original cartoon eyes, with Squidward sitting in a chair in his room that night, with a blank look on his face for roughly 30 seconds before starting to sob softly. Again, the audio is completely missing for most of the scene until the sobbing begins. This is when the sound of a slight breeze through a forest can be heard in the background. It also begins mildly zooming in on Squidward's face, only noticeable if you compare 10 seconds of frames side by side. The sound of him sobbing can suddenly be heard very loudly and severe as the screen twitches in on itself briefly. The salesman laughing. Do it! <laughs> okay, can also be heard echoing in the background. <laughs> oh, there's another image. After another 30 seconds, the screen blurs and twitches violently and as a single frame flashes over the screen. Upon pausing it exactly on the frame, the viewer can see a real-life photo of a deceased six-year-old boy laying in the forest in his underwear whose face has been mangled, eyes have been popped, and stomach cut open with entrails laying beside him. Next to him, the shadow of the photographer is clearly visible with part of the photographer's hand appearing to the right of the screen. Okay, so I thought this was cut out of Red Mist, but I think that I guess this part's still here, but the whole like You know the whole uh What's what's the term for it the uh the meta The, the meta, but it's like a a something piece. I feel like The the, the viewing port. I, I don't know like if the I, if I, interns yeah, if I if I remember what the word is, yeah, if the word if the word I'm looking for comes to me, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, after this photograph is seen, it cuts back to Squidward sobbing, much louder than before, with what appears to be blood running from his eyes instead of tears, and the sound of the salesman still heard. The sound of the wind in the forest is also played at a much louder volume, but now with the sound of branches snapping and the screams of a young boy heard. After 20 more seconds, another single frame appears, this time, of an eight-year-old girl in the forest laying on her stomach in a pool of blood, with her back cut open and entrails piled on top. The shadow of the photographer is also visible. The scene reverts back to Squidward, now with the same realistic red eyes from before, completely silent and no longer sobbing. The sound of the forest can no longer be heard. Another three seconds later and it cuts back to the sobbing, this time piercing loud and with the sound of the forest heard. 
The screams of both a young boy and a young girl can be heard mixed together as the song Amazing Grace plays on both the clarinet and the bagpipes. During this. I, I forgot how it goes. <laughs> oh. Over the course of the seven frames, the hand of the photographer reaches in and grab his, grabs the boy's entrails as his remaining eye focuses on the man's hand and even blinks once. It cuts back to Squidward again, this time staring at the viewer as the sound of the salesman echoes. Do what? And... The red mist is common. <laughs> repeatedly. After oh, sorry. 40 the red mist is common. The red mist is common, boy. <laughs> After 40 seconds of this, the camera quickly pans out to reveal Squidward holding a realistic gun, looking as though it were photoshopped into the scene. Squidward lifts the barrel into his mouth and fires with blood shooting out from his head. On November 7, 2004, after the initial animation of the storyboards were completed in F Fife, Fife, Scotland, I, I don't know, the tape was delivered to the lead animators and sound editors at Paramount Pictures in Hollywood, California during the middle of the night. The tape was taken into the editing room where it was watched by said animators and editors, as well as two 16-year-old interns. The tape, which was supposed to feature the rough cut of the season 4 premiere, Fear of a Krabby Patty, instead began with a title card using the name Squidward's Suicide. While thrown off at first, the animators continued watching, discovering the tape had been heavily tampered with as some kind of dark joke. As a result, four animators, Barry O'Neill, Grant Kirkland Jr., Alyssa Simpson and Jack Gallistan were sent to the hospital while one editor retired, Fernando de la Pina, <laughs> and one intern, Jackie McC McMullen, committing suicide. The tape was then sent to the police, who determined that it had been made by Andrew Skinner, a disgruntled... Ah, oh, delightfully devilish. <laughs> a disgruntled animator from Five Scotland, Scotland, <laughs> Scofflin. Who, who, as a result, has since been charged with nine counts of murder, including the murder of the two children seen in the tape. Oddly enough, after going through the data on the VHS, police discovered that the last edit to the tape had been made exactly 24 seconds before it was watched by the SpongeBob staff. How do you tell that on a VHS tape? I don't know. <laughs> okay. One copy of the tape was made, before the police confiscated the original, by Chaz Agnew, the writer of this article and the sole surviving intern from that same night. Agnew has made various attempts to distribute copies of Skinner's tape and hopes to secure clearance rights to release it on several auction websites soon. He is- Update. He is going to release it as an NFT. Yes. <laughs> That's the update. No. <laughs> update. A Sony Betamax tape, also marked Red Mist, was discovered in a warehouse in mid-eastern Canada on August 12, 2016. It was found by Marcus Andrews, who then reported it to Nickelodeon. The tape was also brought in to Chaz Ag Ang Ang Angu. Oh, is it Angu? Oh, above it's written as Agnew. I th the tape was also brought in to Chaz Agnew. The intern who wrote the account from Squidward's suicide. Just, just to it, clarify, he he didn't mess up. It actually is written as Angu later, like later <laughs> in the story. They had to hunt for a beta VCR in decent condition, but they were able to find one at a nearby Goodwill. When the tape was watched, it was in poor condition. The tape was then cleaned for a few hours, and the quality vastly improved, although still quite low for a beta, which was supposed to be better than any other videotape at the time. The tape fit exactly to the reported contents. And then there's a video. Should I play it? <laughs> That's up to you. Yeah, alright. The great mist is coming! <laughs> the great mist! I, for, I completely forgot the detail of him being Scottish, that just... <laughs> okay, just, just a sec.
I just gotta... I gotta set this up properly so I can actually... Play it. Okay, does this work? Oh, no, that's just the whole page. See, how do I- how do I watch this? This video that's, is unavailable. That's the neat part, you don't. <laughs> hey everybody, look! The real horror, a fandom wiki! <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I guess I can't watch it because it's telling me the video is unavailable, so you just have to- you just have to use your imagination, I guess. We'll, we'll Which is drop the link. Yeah, I'll just drop I'll, the link somewhere. I'll, I'll I'll put it in the chat just so you can see it. There you go. If you wanna if you wanna see if you can find that, be my guest. <laughs> There's one down here called 317 AM, which is the, the other real horror, my sleep schedule. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Back to the wheel. <laughs> The wheel of the worst. <laughs> Escape from Mary Wood. All right. What I uh, remember, uh, there's not any dialogue, so we can probably just alternate. Okay, so. Oh, so it's like. There's dialogue from characters. I see. It's like a sentence at a time. I see, uh. I see the word Konami, which is the third real horror. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, no, wait, I gotta change the title. I for gore. Skull emoji. Oh. No, don't type a. Do a bracket. Okay. Not too long ago, around mid-November 2011, DATED! Konami <laughs> had finished work on a title known as Escape from Marywood. This particular game was more of an experiment in design and advertising rather than a AAA project, not giving any advertising or knowledge to press of any sort, and initially only released in a few locations as a test release. Ah, so it was PT. Yes. Due to the minimal cost of its development, such an experiment was not at all costly at first. Makes sense. Due to the minimal cost, the cost was minimal. <laughs> the game released on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. No Wii version, for reasons that will soon be obvious. Oh no, I mean Only say no more, I, I, I already understand. Only in a few select GameStop stores peppered throughout the states of Massachusetts and Maine, included with a special code to be entered into their website, which would allow direct feedback to the marketing and PR departments. The experiment was an overwhelming failure out of the feedback given. Approximately 98% of the people who bought it and finished it were extremely negative, and in some cases violently angry. Yeah, that sounds about right, too. I don't know what's creepy about this so far. <laughs> As damage control, the game was pulled from shelves. A complete product recall issued that would return the customer's money at double retail price, <laughs> as well as hefty donations given to the stores and employees to keep quiet about it. The game stricken from any records and those involved in its development were even given bribes or threats of termination as a gag order. Of course, any attempts to ask Konami about the game will just get you denials and sent across phone trees until you give up. That's why I'm the one willing to talk about the game. I never gave up my copy for the recall, and thus have not received any sort of silencing bribe, leaving me free to speak as I wish. Feedback on the game's content notwithstanding, the marketing for Escape from Marywood was absolutely brilliant, being that there was none at all. Not a word of it had ever reached me before finding it sitting on the shelves of my local GameStop. What caught my eye, though, more than anything, was the box art, 
which looks like a chalkboard with a scribble of a weird human-like creature on it, like a jointed stick figure, though one arm was bloated and claw-like. The creature was the only thing on the box, not even a title across the top, nor on the spine. Hell, the price tag hadn't even been put on it. Curiosity gripped me like a vice, not knowing what the game was about, or even called, sent me to the counter with it in hand, forking over my $60 and jetting home as fast as possible. Starting up the game would be the standard affair, Konami logo and all that, leading to a rather nice menu screen, keeping the chalkboard motif that was on the cover. There aren't that many options to choose from, being a single player only game, you really only have new game, load, and options. After selecting new game, you are immediately thrown into the game after a short, rather haunting jingle. The first thing the player would notice is the beautiful, surreal, and rather terrifying graphic style, everything looking as if it was drawn with crayons. The player lost in a forest of black and green, the night sky depicted in red. Ah yes, Yoshi's Island is very terrifying. <laughs> Ah, but Konami didn't make that. They had oh, to make their true. own. We'll Black steal it! Bookers. No one will ever know! <laughs> because we'll send them a gag order! <laughs> the second thing one would notice is that the white creature from the box was right in front of them, and charging with a horrific scream. Such an abrupt beginning led to quite a few players dying immediately as being touched by that creature results in a brutal mauling, made even worse by the game's first person perspective. Oh well you didn't you didn't clarify it was in first person. See I was picturing like a crappy side scrolling indie game. What you're supposed to do is actually quite clear if the shock of the creature doesn't paralyze you. Simply turn and flee. The character sprint, while not unlimited, is swift enough to carry the play for a good 30 seconds or so, and they will eventually come across a village of poorly drawn huts and stick figures. Upon reaching this village, the creatures stop the creature stops chasing the player and can be heard lazily walking away back into the darkness. Its heavy, thumping footsteps slowly receding while the player's character collapses from exhaustion and the screen fades to black. Thankfully, the game auto-saves at this point. It should be mentioned that it says the creatures stops chasing the player, so that is a typo here. When the player regains control, the time of day will have shifted to morning, the red sky now a pleasant blue, the childishly drawn sun having a smile on it even. Walking around the village, the stick figure people inform the player that the creature is known as Mary, spelled M-E-R-R-Y like in the title, a guardian of sorts who seems to enforce curfew on the villages of the forest, attacking anyone who leaves their homes at night or tries to leave the forest entirely. From here, the player is given quite a bit of freedom, able to buy a sword and even a handgun from the village and go off into the woods. I admit, the first time I went out of the village during the day, I nearly had a heart attack as I encountered Mary almost immediately. Thankfully, when the sun is up, Mary will not harm the player and even chat with them. The sun is so nice. Don't look directly at it, though. He chirp, all the voices in the game being garbled gibberish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to read it. <laughs> Mostly, Mary's dialogue is either exclamations of how nice the day is, how cute the animals are, or generic advice one would give to a child, such as, don't talk to strangers. While he is pleasant, for lack of a better word, the player is advised to not attack Mary in any way, as he turns immediately hostile and is completely invincible to damage. Yeah, like the, like the chickens in Zelda, sounds about right. <laughs> Getting hit by his massive claw arm results in a rather piercing scream from the player character, as well as the screen starting to rip as if it were paper being clawed at by a bear, until being entirely sliced into ribbons and falling away, replaced with, You are dead! A sad face emoticon <laughs> and an option to continue or quit. <laughs> uh. However, as long as you do not attack Mary, attempt to go past a certain boundary on the map, helpfully outlined with red, or leave a village at nighttime, the player can pretty much ignore him, though they may also talk to him to get new dialogue, which will be explained later. 
Upon reaching the second village, either by following the map or simply wandering about, the player character will, will come to learn that Mary is indeed invincible and can only be killed by any damage he inflicts upon himself. The player will also be laughed at for asking the likelihood of Mary committing suicide as he is the happiest thing alive. In case that last sentence didn't hit you like the brick it is, let me spell it out for you. The objective of this game is to escape the woods by finding a way to make the happiest thing alive kill itself. From here on, the player's duty is to wander the woods, searching for any artifacts scattered about, as well as searching for things called Mary's Happiness Shrines, which are crudely made altars adorned with flowers, trinkets, and even candies. The player finds these altars and must destroy them with complete and utter malice, smashing them, ripping the flowers apart, stomping on the sweets, etc. Along the way, they'll have regular enemy encounters, mostly hostile wildlife, bandits with knives, and these strange guys called Ockymen, who carry handguns, and tend to be rather annoying surprises when you get shot in the back. In addition to breaking these altars, the player is encouraged to observe Mary, see which animals he's taking a liking to, or which items he seems fond of, and either killing slash destroying them while he's in the way, or finding a way to do so right in front of him without being seen. This is where Mary's additional dialogue comes in. Talking to him after breaking a few altars will have him talk about an unfortunate accident, but the more the player d does to wreck his emotional state, the worse the dialogue gets, to the point of Mary flat out saying things like, Please leave me alone. Eventually, the player character will come across the items necessary to complete the game. A teddy bear, a faded photograph, and a lighter. Once the player has these, they may confront Mary by trying to leave the forest, and waiting for him to come charging at them as always. This, this time, time however, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, you no, go, go ahead. You read that one. This time, however, instead of being killed, which in the case of an attempted escape would be instant death via cutscene, a quick time event will appear labeled Present Teddy. Upon doing this, Mary will stop in his tracks, angrily ranting about how he started to suspect you were the one doing these awful things to him. If you wait too long, Mary will attack and kill you, so instead, the player has to ignore his ranting and press the attack button, which will lead the character to rip off the teddy bear's head. Mary will screech in an agonized fashion, his angry rant turning to one of a child whose pet just died, and from this point, he will not attack. The player must continue pressing the attack button, the sequence of events following being throwing the teddy bear to the ground, taking out the photo, setting it on fire, and tossing the flaming photo onto the teddy bear. The entire time, Mary will be screaming, sobbing, saying how he just wanted to make you happy, but the player is to ignore this and continue pressing the button, which will lead to the character screaming insults, telling Mary nobody likes him, that he'd be better off dead, and flat out telling him to kill himself, and the last few lines simply being, DO IT! DO IT! Repeated over and over again. <laughs> the red mist is coming! <laughs> Mary, the red mist is coming! <laughs> After a painfully long time telling this creature to die, the weapon select menu will appear on screen, though the option equip is replaced with offer. From here, the player can choose anything. Giving a Mary a sword will lead him to. Giving Mary a sword will lead to him stabbing himself repeatedly. Giving him a handgun, he shoots himself in the head. Giving him nothing, he runs into a pack of nearby wolves and lets them devour him. The most painful to watch, though, is giving him a shotgun, where the beast will clumsily fumble with it until the barrel is in his mouth and then pull the trigger with his normal hand. Regardless, Regardless. of your... Yeah, it's, it's weird with these, like, really short paragraphs, that's the one thing. Do you want to do these next two? Okay. Oh, I thought you were- I thought you meant you were gonna do that one. No. Regardless of your choice, though, the instant Mary falls dead, the music comes to a halt and the graphics suddenly change going from the crude crayon look to sudden realism. 
The perspective remains in first person as the player character steps over something that can't be seen and calmly exits the forest, stepping out of the woods onto a highway where a beat-up old truck is waiting. This entire time, only the sound of footsteps, the opening of the truck's door, and the starting of its engine are heard as the player character begins to drive off, the game ending with a sudden cut to black, no credits, and booting the player back to the main menu. Honestly, that 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 was that was interesting. That was an interesting one. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> somebody said somebody in the comments, 2016, fuck Konami. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a that would be a cool one to make an actual. Oh wait, anyway, I think somebody might have made a game based off of it. Yeah, I'd be surprised if somebody hadn't. It, it feels almost like bait for it, but I don't necessarily mind. Right. All right. So, I figured we're about at an hour and a half. I figured I would go for maybe two hours, because that's my usual stream time. Does that sound good to you? Uh, it's up to you. I wouldn't mind going for longer, but... Yeah, I just probably didn't want to go past, you know, too far past 11, but you know what, we'll just, we'll read another one, at least, and we'll go from there. Okay. Spin to win! And we got Tails Doll. Oh boy. Can we spin again? <laughs> no, it's too late now. Oh boy. This really is the wheel of the worst. Assuming... Assuming we can find the one that's just, like... Like, I don't the know, original. like... Yeah, I... We, we might not be able to, because I don't know... I don't know what the original is or how to find it. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, here, here it is. It... Oh, it's... It's really short. If the, if this is the right one, like the one on the Know Your Meme page. If that's the right one, then it's it's really short. We can get through that really fast. Okay. Um, oh, but I gotta, perfect. But I gotta put up an image. Where's my text? Okay, here it is. Okay. A man came home from work with a gift for his son. He had picked up a new video game for him. Sonic R. <gasps> the horror! It was a racing game. Wait, no, 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 no! Wait, no! <laughs> and when he gave his son the gift, he was so excited to get it and play it right away. That's the fourth horror, is owning a Sega Saturn. <laughs> That night, he played the game with his son, and they had a great time. A couple of days later, the boy was almost finished with the game. It, it, not, <laughs> not surprising, the game lasts like five minutes. Um, I mean, <laughs> if you're not playing multi- if you're just trying to unlock everything, you know. His dad was there in the room when he beat the last boss- WRONG! <laughs> Sonic R does not have bosses. <laughs> and he roared oh. in excitement when he finally did it. He smiled and asked him how he liked the game as he watched the credit screen, and he said, <laughs> "He said, well, what's that?" The, he asked the boy when the Tails doll appeared on the screen. The boy said it was the Tails doll. That was all he knew. <laughs> That's all any of us know because he only appeared in that one game. He told his son it was time for bed. During the night, the curious father went into the boy's room and turned on the TV very quietly to play the game for a while himself. He noticed that he now had the option to play his Tails doll. He chose him to tag up with some of the gang. The game was fun until he tagged him up with Sonic. The screen went black, and when the game system shut itself down... Oh, when the game system shut itself down. Yeah, I don't know what it is about these creepy pastas, but it's making us, like, miss words. The man decided, I feel like the sentence structure is too simple. Yeah, it's like, it, and also, there are like genuine mistakes in this, so it's like, <laughs> there's right. like, half of it is us messing up, and then the other half is 
us reading out mistakes intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the screen went black when the game system shut itself down. The man decided it was time for him to go to sleep since he had to work in the morning, so he crept out of his son's room and went to lay in, in bed with his wife. <laughs> At around 2 a.m., he woke up when he heard thumps on his door. He assumed it was his son getting up to ask him about something. He told the boy, Stop, go back to bed. The thumping kept happening, and at one point he noticed a little shadow coming from under the door. Tails kept popping into his head. He got out of bed and slowly opened the door. Then he heard someone say this very softly, You're coming with me forever. It was a the doll. Red mist is coming. <laughs> the red mist is coming. It was a doll. An evil blood-covered, possessed little doll. It was the doll from the game. It had to be. It just has to be. It has to be. Uh, well, who else could it be? And, and that's it. That's the whole pasta. Is there something you should tell me, big buddy? <laughs> It's the doll from the game. I'm telling you, it just has to be. <laughs> okay, so next one. And, uh, no, we already got that one. I, I forgot to take it off the wheel. Yeah, the red mist is back on here. What do you mean? Come on, rap rat. Rap rat. <laughs> Called it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I might take Pin Pal off the list because I don't think we have time to write, read it at this point. No. Yeah, okay, so... This one is a longer one, anyhow. Alright. Oh, he's got a page on the Villains Wiki. That's how you know it's serious. <laughs> Also, I am so lucky that OBS supports WebPs, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the changing, changing the text. Okay. Ever heard of Nightmare? Like a lot of other games in the 90s, it came with a VHS, which you timed with your play. That, that, that happened? How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was like one of those freaking like, maybe it was like some kind of board game VCR hybrid thing. And I, like I'm thinking video games. No, it is a, it's like a VCR yeah. tape. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, how how on earth do you do that? The character on the video would give you instructions on what to do while you played the game in real time. Being a scaredy cat, I refused to play it when my mom bought it for us. My brother was disappointed about not being able to play Nightmare, but my mom had a solution. Uh, you know, actually, I might have read this one before. Not, like, on the Creepypasta Theater, but I... Like, on my own. Uh, this, yeah. this this feels familiar. She brought out Rap Rat. It was a cheap, dingy little thing catered to kids my age. You went around the board, collected cheese, and the first player to reach the end would win. It seemed simple enough, and since it reminded us of Mousetrap... Which we didn't have. There were no objections. <laughs> we popped the movie into the VHS... VCR and set up the board. The first part of the video was just a simple explanation of the rules as well as the instructions on how the game worked. Then Rap Rat came onto the TV. He was... not what any of us had been expecting. My smaller brother, who was only three at the time, immediately left the room, crying. The rat did not even resemble a rat. The ears were far too big. It had a mouth lined with two teeth, and the inside of the mouth looked almost swollen. The most striking part about the thing, though, was the eyes. They were large, glassy, and fish-like. I asked, then bothered, then begged my mom to turn it off. Rap Rat suddenly shouted loudly, screaming and wailing, saying, WAIT YOUR TURN! Wait. Wait, Wait. your turn! <laughs> Wait, you... And a demonic. <laughs> the red mist is coming. 
in a demonic, low-pitched voice that was not at all like his normal, obnoxious nasal voice. In the background, we could hear the narrator saying, He's Rap Rat and he's the boss. Over he's Rap over. Rat and he's the boss. Over and over again in an overly serious tone. Oh, sorry. He's Rap Rat and he's the boss. <laughs> the video was indescribable. Images crossed the screen in quick succession, overcut with Rap Rat's expressionless eyes. The images were some of the things I was afraid of at the time. A person looking over a balcony, a hornet slowly stinging someone's eye, an extreme close-up of a tarantula, a pit full of writhing cobras, and a bloodied syringe filled with green fluid. We immediately turned the video off, and I ran out of the room screaming, slamming my door. It took my mom 20 minutes to convince me that the video was gone, that I would never ever see it again. I had neat nightmares all week about Rap Rat. That wasn't the last time I saw a Rap Rat. While my, my girlfriend and I were preparing to move in together, I was cleaning out the closet of my room and found Rap Rat again, with the same VHS and the same board game inside. It was almost perfectly intact, intact, save for a thick layer of cobwebs and dust bunnies on top of it. This was strange. Didn't my mother get rid of it? And what was the game doing in my room? I let out a bit of a gasp when I found it, and when my girlfriend came into the room asking what was the matter, breathing harshly, I said, <laughs> Rap Rat. She then broke up with me. <laughs> she laughed a bit, asking if it was a joke. I shook my head, explaining that it wasn't. She didn't believe me, nobody did, and I decided the only way to prove it was to show her the video. I borrowed my neighbor's VHS, VCR, and played the video for her. However, the images had changed. I saw a clown, its nose bursting and spraying blood under the screen. I saw a woman alone in a dark room. I saw a man being forced to pick up white-hot metal and hold it in his outstretched hand, turning his hand into a leathery mess. The scratching I heard as a child continued, picking up louder and louder. Then, Rap Rat showed up and began twisting and convulsing its arms thrusting this way and that. The costume wasn't a costume anymore. The felt was real fur. So, so he, was doing, he was doing the thing that Kermit does. He's like, it's the Muppet Show. Ah! Yeah, it sounds okay. like it. <laughs> okay. Its face wasn't plastic, but instead a bristle of thorns with teeth. The eyes turned inwards and suddenly popped out again. Rap Rat's huge fish eyes were inside out, staring right at me, watching my every move, my every expression. It grinned widely and gestured at my girlfriend and I with a single, outstretched, inhuman hand. I could hear the faintest scratching at my front door. The TV went blank and showed static. The scratching got louder. It wasn't scratching anymore, but the thumping, the thumping of tiny feet on wood. My girlfriend embraced me in fear, and my senses kicked in. Before anything else could happen, I stopped the video, ejected it, and unplugged the VCR. The scratching stopped. When I looked out the living room window, nothing was there. The police showed up soon after, warning us that a neighbor had seen a figure outside of our door and had called in concern. See, that's how you know it's unrealistic. <laughs> my girlfriend- I'm sorry, that's really cynical of me. My girlfriend and I couldn't simply couldn't explain what had happened, and had to tell the police officer that it was us. I was furious that a children's game was terrifying me. I went to pick up the tape, but the VHS burned my hand. But wait, do we mean the VHS or the VCR? <laughs> it felt like I touched a Bunsen burner on the highest setting. We had to get the oven mitts from the kitchen in order to take it out, and even then it was scorching hot. I brought it outside, tossed it down the sidewalk, sidewalk, and crushed it with my winter boots. Now see, why why couldn't you just say, Oh, we didn't see anybody. Gosh, can you like keep an eye out or something? Like you right. don't have to you don't have to explain that it was a freaking demonic rat. Right. <laughs> my girlfriend and I had nightmares every night. We would both wake up in the middle of the night and describe eerily similar images that we saw in our sleep. 
scratching would always be there at night when lights were off and the room was pitch black, save for the moonlight coming through the window. Now, though, the scratching would happen every time I went near the front door, and every time we said Rap Rat's name. It sounded as if something very small was dragging something across the ground outside of the door, pacing, waiting. I would simply wait with the covers pulled up to my neck until I succumbed to exhaustion. At this point, I was determined to sue the company for damages. The first thing I did was call my mother and ask where she got Rap Rat. She had no idea. I found a merchant who sold versions of Rap Rat and asked how I could get in touch with the company. He sent me this email. Oh, I figured you would read it. Uh, I, I don't know. I figured you would. Uh, I don't know about the game, but I know it was created by the same people who created Nightmare. The company is called A Couple of Cowboys. Try them. <laughs> I did a bit more research and discovered that the company became defunct in 1994. Only two years after the company created Rap Rat, I discovered why they did soon after. In 1992, the year of the game's development, a couple of cowboys had commissioned- <laughs> Best company name ever. A couple of cowboys had commissioned, commissioned a manufacturing company in Haiti to create the doll portrayed in the game. The company who created the puppet ran a sweatshop where they for forced women and children to produce the various components of the puppet, including the felt and plastic of the doll. One day, a young Haitian girl got her arm caught in the industrial sewing machine. The spring loader, unable to handle the weight on the machine, came loose and struck the child's neck, killing her instantly. A few days after the funeral, the mother of the child came to the factory, demanding to see the owner, who denied that he had anything to do with it. In a fit of rage, the mother said that the blood from the innocent would seep into every crevice of the doll, every component with which it was created, and all who touched it would die. She claimed to have summoned a fear demon and screamed at the top of her lungs, Apparat will, cur will curse you. <laughs> the owner simply laughed and told his corporate bosses about Apparat. They spread the joke from person to person, and the game was renamed Raprat, a loose anagram of Apparat. Each recitation of the name Apparat brought with it a greater and greater curse. Only two years after Rap Rat was created, the company was shut down and the owners hired by Mattel. There were stories of the workers begging for days off, skipping work for weeks and weeks, finding the puppet in strange places. Sooner there were some stories of suicides. Grim, violent suicides in which the workers would stab their hands and burn themselves to death, writing I am fear on the nearest surface in blood. Nobody knows where the Rap Rat doll went after the original creators disappeared. Some say that the last things the victims saw before going insane were large, sunken, fish-like eyes. Words of warning. Never, ever say Apparat. Out loud. Beetlejuice. <laughs> out loud. Saying a demon's name out loud is an invitation to them, a calling. If you have already done this, it cannot be undone. Two, do not try to speak to or contact Apparat. Avoid being awake between 3.30 and 4 a.m. when Raprat is the most likely to try to scare you. Well, God, I'm fucked. <laughs> the audio. The VHS is back. I thought I stomped on it, smashed it to Kingdom Come, but it's back. I found it in my sock drawer yesterday. This time, I was ready. A whole bunch of people have been contacting me, trying to get the tape or some sort of video from the board game. My answer to you is that it's just too dangerous. If I did that, it could very well drive you insane, scare you to death. The video, and the game, and Rap Rat itself has some sort of strange power. Rap Rat follows me everywhere I go. I see little shadows in the corner, or hear sounds coming down the hallway when I'm the only one home. If Rap Rat is there, it will let you know, but it will never let you see it. Until it's too late, of course. A lot of a people- lot of, Oh. Go, go a lot ahead. of people have been watching the normal video for the normal board game. That's the thing. Rap Rat can be normal. It will trick you into thinking it's just a puppet, and then stalk you day and night. 
Yeah, so that's... Rap Rat. Was Rap Rat a real game? I apparently... Yes, it is. Apparently it twas. As the, the TV tropes... Page is right here. Yeah, the full video is on YouTube. Ah. And it looks about as fun to play as you would expect. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Game Breaker. Late in the tape, Rap Rat will make a player skip a number of turns based on their age. While this might work with the kid demographic the game was targeted for, any adults who are, for example, playing with their kids are essentially out of the game at that point if it is unfortunate enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I lost 47 turns. <laughs> uh, saying it's very common for players to ignore the VHS portion of the game as it disrupts it way too much. It says it can be played fine without it anyway, as Rap Rat himself only rarely interacts with the game board itself, and whatever effects if it has on gameplay are negligible at best. All right, so still a little bit of a little bit of time. Let's see what we got. Let me remove Rap Rat from the list. Yes! It is time for Dead Bart. Oh, goody. <laughs> now I have to... I have to post this really gruesome image. And again, it's a web P. What's with all the web P's? I mean, I'm not one of those people who's going to, you know, go on a, a rant about web P's. It's up to the programs for not supporting it, in my no, opinion. No, I'm, I'm gonna rant about red, uh, web P's. <laughs> I mean, to each their own. <laughs> anyway, uh, do, you, do you have it up? Yes, I do. Okay. You know how Fox has a weird way of counting Simpsons episodes? They refuse to count a couple of them, making the amount of episodes inconsistent. The reason for this is a lost episode from season one. Finding details about this missing episode is difficult. No one who was working on the show at the time likes to talk about it. From what has been pieced together, the lost episode was written entirely by Matt Greening. During production of the first season, Matt started to act strangely. He was very quiet, seemed nervous and morbid. Mentioning this to anyone who was present results in them getting very angry and forbidding you to ever mention it to Matt. No TV and no beer makes Matt Greening go crazy. I first heard of it at an event where David Silverman was speaking. Someone in the crowd asked about the episode, and Silverman simply left the stage, ending the production hours early, a presentation. The episode's production number was 7G06. The title was Dead Bart. The episode, lab lab the episode labeled 7G06, Moaning Lisa, was made later and given Dead Bart's production code to hide the latter's existence. In addition to getting angry, asking anyone who was on the show about this will cause them to do everything they can to stop you from directly communicating with Matt Greening. At a fan event, I managed to follow him after he spoke to the crowd, and eventually had a chance to talk to him alone as he was leaving the building. He didn't seem upset that I had followed him, probably expected a typical counter with an obsessive fan. When I mentioned the lost episode, though, all color drained from his face and he started trembling. When I asked him if he could tell me any details, he sounded like he was on the verge of tears. He grabbed a piece of paper, wrote something on it, and handed it to me. 
he begged me never to mention the episode again. The piece of paper had a website address on it. I'd rather not say what it was, for reasons you'll see in a second. I entered the address into my browser, and I came to a site that was completely black except for a line of yellow text, a download link. I clicked on it, and a file started downloading. Once the file was downloaded, my computer went crazy. It was the worst virus I had ever seen. System Restore didn't work, the entire computer had to be rebooted. Before doing this though, I copied the file onto a CD. I tried to open it on my now empty computer, and as I suspected, there was an episode of The Simpsons on it. <laughs> like, I like the implication of them just trying to destroy your PC. <laughs> Which right. I mean, I guess makes sense, but it's still funny. Yeah. Just Matt, Matt Groening gave me a super virus. <laughs> The episode started off like any other episode, but it had very poor quality animation. If you've seen the original animation for Some Enchanted Evening, it was similar but less stable. The first act was fairly normal, but the way the characters acted was a little off. Homer seemed angrier, Marge seemed depressed, Lisa seemed anxious, and Bart seemed to have genuine anger and hatred for his parents. The episode was about the Simpsons going on a plane trip near the end of the first act. The plane was taking off. Bart was fooling around as you'd expect. However, as the plane was about 50 feet off the ground, Bart broke a window on the plane and was sucked out. At the beginning of the series, Matt had an idea that the animated style of the Simpsons world represented life, and that death turned things more realistic. This was used in this episode. The picture of Bart's corpse was barely recognizable. They took full advantage of it not having to move and made almost made an almost photorealistic drawing. Of photorealistic, his take a shot. <laughs> act one ended with the shot of Bart's corpse. When Act two started, Homer, Marge, and Lisa were sitting at their table crying. The crying went on and on. It got more pained and sounded more realistic better acting than you would think possible. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you really if you really put him up to the task, Dan Casanella can can do some amazing things. The animation started to decay even more as they cried, and you could hear murmuring in the background. The red mist is coming. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm b speaking of the ground, I am going to put that joke in it. <laughs> <laughs> The characters could barely be made out. They were stretching and blurring. They looked like deformed shadows with random bright colors thrown on them. There were faces looking in the window, flashing in and out, so you were never sure what they looked like. This crying went on for all of Act 2. Act 3 opened with a title card saying one year had passed. Marge, Homer, Marge, and Lisa were skeletally thin and still sitting at the table. There were no sign of Maggie or the pets. They decided to visit Bart's grave. Springfield was completely deserted, and as they walked to the cemetery, the houses became more and more decrepit. They all looked abandoned. When they got to the grave, Bart's body was just lying in front of his tombstone, looking just like it did at the end of that one. Yeah, see, Family. the thing is, they just had that one animation cell, and... <laughs> And they were like, well, we can't, we got to reuse this. We can't, we, we spent so long drawing this hyper-realistic Bart. We can't just like not have, we can't just have him buried in the ground. <laughs> the family started crying again. Eventually they stopped and just stared at Bart's body. The camera zoomed in on Homer's face. According to summaries, Homer tells a joke at this part, but it isn't audible in the version I saw. You can't tell what Homer is saying. The view zoomed out as the episode came to a close. The tombstones in the background had the names of every Simpsons guest star on them. Some that no one had heard of in 1989, some that haven't been on the show yet. All of them had death dates on them. For guests who died since, like Michael Jackson or George Harrison, the dates were when they would die. The credits were completely silent and seemed handwritten. The final image was the Simpson family on their couch, like in the intros, but all drawn in hyper-realistic style, Take a shot. lifeless style of Bart's corpse. 
A thought occurred oh. to me after seeing- Oh, you want to read this one? Sure. <laughs> Alright. A thought occurred to me after seeing the episode for the first time. You could try to use the tombstones to predict the death of living Simpsons guest stars, but there's something odd about most of the ones who haven't died yet. All of their deaths are listed as the same date. Ah, uh, yep. 2012. <laughs> Should we do one more? Yeah, we'll do one more. You know, get it up to... A nice two hours. Right. Alright, so the last one will be the strangest security tape I've ever seen. Not a bad one to end with. This is a bit of a longer one as well. Alright. So I'll just turn off this image and let me change the text. It's the longest creepypasta title I've ever seen. <laughs> Is it though? Really? I mean, I don't know. Granted, I haven't seen that many. I'm just, I'm going to write a, uh, I'm going to write a creepy post about uh, Sonic and All Stars racing transformed, and that'll that'll top it. Okay. Okay. I work at a Sonic gas. Sonic and Sega All Stars. Oh, Sonic and Sega All Stars. Right. Actually, I think they removed the Sega from Transformed, probably because it was just too long. Really? <laughs> or maybe because they, you know, they had non-Sega characters in it. Right. I don't know. You you'd have to ask Sega. I couldn't tell you. I work at a gas station in rural Pennsylvania. It's a boring job, but it's pretty easy and it pays all right. A few weeks ago, this new guy started. I'll call him Jeremy. Jeremy's weird. He's about 25 or 26 and he hardly speaks, but he's got the creepiest laugh I've ever heard. This is going to become relevant. It's gonna be like, I'm, I'm calling it now. Don't tell me if I'm right, but I'm calling it now. <laughs> He's going to be listening to the security tape, and he's like, who did this? And then Jeremy's going to be like, he 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 Okay. That's just, I that's, don't know. That's my prediction. Uh, my boss and I have both noticed this, but it's never been a problem, so there's not much we can do about it. Customers have never complained about him, and he's always done his job fairly well. Up until a few weeks ago, anyway. That's when things started going missing. Employee theft can be a problem at any business that sells consumer goods. And there's only one person working at a time at this gas station. Pretty small place. About two weeks ago, my boss started noticing that we were short on motor oil. At first, it was a few containers at a time, then entire shelves and boxes from the back room. Pretty soon, entire shipments would be gone the day after we got them, and it would always be right after Jeremy's shifts. My boss has checked the security camera tapes from every single night he worked, but he can never catch him in the act. Jeremy would lock up at closing, then the motor oil would be gone the next day. Okay, maybe it's not going to be so simple because they're throwing out the whole, yeah, Jeremy's stealing stuff right away. There's, a, it, it might be like a little bit more than that. So I, I retract my prediction. Okay. <laughs> My boss usually takes the tapes home with him to try and catch Jeremy stealing, but his daughter had a softball game last night, so he asked me to watch the tape for him. He offered to pay me overtime under the table, so obviously I took that offer. There are three cameras, so he gave me three different tapes to check. I figured it would be a long night, but I'm trying to save up for vacation, so I really needed the money. I took the tapes home, popped them in an old VCR, and sat back. See, these guy, this guy knows what a VCR is. Also, hey, Isaac. <laughs> oh, howdy. He says, you mean to tell me there are motor oil creepypastas? Yes. Yes. The vanishing motor oil. Um, two, two days, days ago. Oh. Like, I mean, you can take this one if you want to. Okay. Two days ago, and the last time he worked, Jeremy started at 4 p.m. Everything seemed pretty normal at first. He counted up his drawer, switched off with the girl who was working before him, and waited for a customer. 
The first person who came in was Mrs. Templeton. The timestamp on the video read 403. A regular. She picked up her cigarettes and a her newspaper cigarettes. and paid. <laughs> Learn the real cost. Uh, <laughs> she the picked fifth, up her cigarette. The fifth real horror. Oh, yeah. Bad teeth. <laughs> She picked up her cigarettes and a newspaper and paid with a 20. Nothing unusual there. The next customer was some local guy named Ron. Right. He drives a motorcycle, usually comes in every few days. He filled up his tank, got a bag of beef jerky, paid with his credit card, and then left. Next was some guy with a cowboy hat. I'd never seen him before, but we get plenty of strangers passing through, just like at any gas station. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel, paid with a hundred dollar bill, and went on his way. I sat back and sighed. The only thing more boring than doing this job is watching someone else do it. My boss's offer was enough to keep me watching, though, so I left the tape on. Everything seemed pretty normal. I had a feeling that if Jeremy was stealing motor oil, he knew we were suspicious of him by now. I didn't expect him to be dumb enough to let us catch him on camera. Things stayed boring and routine until about five o'clock. At 5.03, Mrs. Templeton came back in. She must have forgotten something, but she didn't. She bought the same pack of cigarettes as before, in the same newspaper. She paid with another 20. That's odd, I thought, but then again, she's a little absent-minded. I thought Jeremy could have, should have told her she already got her smokes, but it's not against the rules to sell somebody the same thing twice. That's when Ron came in again. He bought another tank of gas for his motorcycle again, I later checked the outdoor camera because I thought maybe he had another car he wanted to fill up and the same pack of beef jerky. He paid with his credit card again. No big deal. I figured this was just a weird coincidence. Mrs. Templeton is forgetful and Ron probably owns more than one Harley. That's when the guy in the cowboy hat came back in. I feel a ch felt a chill run down my spine. Don't get diesel, don't get diesel. I found myself whispering to my empty living room, but he did. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel and paid with another $100 bill. Every mood he made was identical to his first visit, right down to the way he scratched his nose before he walked out. Either this guy is rich, owns a lot of trucks, and just moved into town, or something really bizarre was happening. I kept watching. Now this guy, it sounds like Jeremy is like a JoJo villain at this point. Alright, proceed. Grab the adventure. Did he die? <laughs> Sorry. Here we die. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> real life creepypasta just happened. So, every customer for the next hour. Yeah. Every customer for the next hour was the same as before. Every single one. I was seriously freaked out, and then at 6:03. Mrs. Templeton walked back in. She bought her cigarettes and newspaper again, and paid with a 20 again. I thought I was going to lose it. I only watched another half hour before I started fast-forwarding through the rest. It was all the same. Every customer would come in at the exact same times, exactly one hour apart. Now I know what you're thinking. That sneaky motherfucker Jeremy messed with the tapes. <laughs> he pooped himself. <laughs> He had run a loop of his first hour of business over and over. That wasn't the case. There are windows around the cash register areas, area that the camera covers, and I watched the sunlight fade as time ran on. Jeremy's routine didn't loop over. He swept, mopped, restocked, and did all of his duties exactly how he would expect. But the same customers kept coming in. And I was the panicking. King, the king came in and asked for dinner. And Morshu came in and asked for bombs. Uh, Isaac says there was something genuinely spooky about Dustin sincerely asking Kirby's adventure while Luigi's Mansion's somber <laughs> piano was playing in the background. It's the dedicated Kirby's adventure button, you know, like when you don't have an object to interact with. Sean! <laughs> um, I was panicking at this point. Something was seriously wrong with what I was seeing, and I had no explanation for it. I skipped ahead to when he had locked up and walked out to his car. He hadn't stolen anything, but I kept watching just to make sure. I fast-forwarded one last time to about midnight. 
At exactly 2.03, out of nowhere, Jeremy's face pops up on camera. I didn't mean he moved his head into view. I mean, one second the store was empty, and the next second his face was all I could see. Here, I will perform a dramatic reenactment. <laughs> he wasn't looking at the camera, he was looking at me. I was sure about it. I screamed and fumbled for the remote, but by the time I grabbed it, he was gone, just as soon as he had left. One frame he was there, the next he wasn't. My hands were shaking like crazy, but I popped in another tape. The other indoor camera shows the back area by the cash register. I would be able to see how he got his face up to the camera like that. I skipped ahead to 203, but there was nothing. I would have been able to see him standing on a chair or something on this tape, but he wasn't there. I didn't see him enter the store at all after he left. It's like he wasn't really there. He doesn't know the security code, and no, ar no alarms were triggered that night after he locked up. What I did see, however, was that at 2.03, the motor oil vanished off the shelf. All of it. Same as Jeremy's face. One second it was there, and the next it wasn't. I turned that tape off and went to bed, but I didn't get a wink of sleep. My body is exhausted right now, but my mind is racing. That tape was undoubtedly the creepiest, most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life. One might even say it was the strangest security tape I've ever seen. I added that last bit for comedic effect. Yes, it was very comedic. <laughs> I work in a few hours. My boss asked me to bring the tapes back in and let him know what I found. But really, what the hell am I going to say? Jeremy works the night shift tonight, directly after me, and the plan is for my boss to come in just before I leave and confront with confront him with me, as I'm supposed to be the one who caught him stealing. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I, su I, suppose, I suppose I'll have to show my boss the tapes, but I don't want to watch them with him. I never want to see something like that again. I can't get the image of Jeremy just directly smiling into the camera out of my mind. It was the creepiest look I've ever seen on another human being's face. Anyway, I'm going to try to get some last minute sleep before I have to go in and deal with this. I'll let you guys know what happens. Update. 2.49pm. Updating from my phone. Apologies in advance for errors. My boss just finished watching the last of the tapes. I told him what to expect, but you really can't prepare someone for something like that. He's scared shitless. I still am too. And Jeremy is due to come in at 4. We've got a little over an hour to get our shit together, but neither one of us knows what to say to him. Is he just a fucked up guy who likes to steal motor oil and scare the shit out of people, or is he something else? I don't know if this is crazy, but does anyone think he could have something to do with the time loop? My boss said he never noticed anything like that in the other tapes, but the way he popped up in this one made me think he knew I would be watching. It's like he wanted me to see what he could do like he was showing off or something. The way he smiled into the camera was like a little kid showing you a sandcastle they just built or something. I don't know, I probably sound crazy. <laughs> I sure feel the part. I'm going to talk to my boss some more. We have to calm ourselves down and figure out how to handle this. I'll update again tonight, but I have a really bad feeling about how this is going to play out. Update, 4.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update, 5.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update, 6.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update, 7.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update, 8.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. And I, I feel like you could probably end the creepypasta there, but it continues. Uh, update. <laughs> you good? What are you doing, Joe? You got a hairball? <laughs> That's a yak. You gonna yak him on the floor? <laughs> I was wondering what that was. <laughs> Update 10:58 p.m. Holy shit! Holy shit! Holy shit! Holy shit! 
I just got home and saw my previous updates. Things make less sense now than ever. Here's what I can tell you. I went to work. Jeremy never showed up. My boss and I decided to call the police, as you're well aware. When I picked up the phone to call, though, the sun went out. I shit you not, that's what I thought happened. Apparently, I blacked out for exactly five hours, because when I looked at the clock, it was 9.33. I think I got stuck in Jeremy's time loop, and then I snapped out of it at the exact point I blacked out, if that makes sense. But that's when things got really weird. My boss was standing right next to me when I blacked out, ready to corrobor corroborate? I- yes. I'm learning that I have not actually said a lot of big words in conversation. No, you've- yeah, that, I think you got it. <laughs> my story to the cops. When I came to, the phone was in my hand, but it was dead. Not even a dial tone. My boss was still right there, but he wasn't moving. He was standing up, but frozen. I looked at the clock again, and it wasn't moving. The second hand was stuck on the 12th. It was 9.33 exactly. The clock on the register computer screen wasn't moving either. My phone was frozen. There was even a customer at the register, waiting for my boss to get him cigarettes. I'm betting that would have been his fifth pack of the day. I got the fuck out of there. Didn't lock up, didn't turn the lights out, and... Sorry guys, I didn't grab the security tapes to upload on the internet. Believe me, that was the last thing on my mind. The gas station is on a major highway, and cars were parked all along it, Except they weren't parked, they were frozen. The people inside were sitting still as wax statues. I got in my car and prayed that it would start. Thankfully it did. About halfway home, time started up again. The static from the radio turned into music. Well, wait, if time was frozen, I don't think you'd get static either. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding, I don't know. Who, ca who cares? Like it's supposed to be, and from what I could tell by listening to the host talk in between songs, no one noticed the time freeze or whatever it was. I was the only one. Well, I'm sure Jeremy noticed as well. I still have no yeah. cue where he is. No, no clue where he is or what he's doing. I'm hiding in my room and calling the police again in the morning. I don't know if I ever got through to them before, or if I did, whether they took me seriously. I'm scared for my life at this point. I'll update tomorrow if I can. Son! You're, you're you're dealing with a time god. You, the police ain't gonna do nothing. <laughs> Our weapons um, are useless. <laughs> um, final update: ten thirty-three a.m. I finally fell asleep last night around four. Oh wait, I I, I, I want to say real quick: it's very appropriate that the Chrono Trigger music is playing while I say that. <laughs> ah. Okay, continue. Indeed. Um, I finally fell asleep last night around 4. I have no idea how I did it, I guess. Exhaustion finally got the best of me. This morning I woke up to my phone ringing. It was my boss. He'd been calling me since about 6. He woke up when time turned back on last night and immediately called the cops. They, ca they came by to see what was wrong and he told them everything. The police are around here are all small time guys. They were more concerned with the missing motor oil than anything, but my boss figured he would take it as long as he had their attention. They decided to go looking for Jeremy. We keep all of our employees' applications on file, and since Jeremy just started working here, his was easy to find. They checked the address on it and headed over to the house. You're not going to believe what they found. Number 10 will shock you. <laughs> The address Jeremy listed on his application was an empty lot, or at least now it is. There used to be a house there, but it burned down in 1993. Being a small town, almost everyone remembers that fire. A family of four used to live there way back when. Rumor has it that they had an estranged son who they never really talked about, but I can't say for sure if that's true. What I can say is true is that after an insurance investigation, the fire was ruled in arson. The entire house was soaked in oil and torched with a Molotov cocktail. The entire family was sleeping when it happened. None of them survived. They never caught the guy who did it. Rumor has it that when they tried to contact the estranged son, no one could find him. 
Anyway, my boss called and told me this, and I freaked out. Then he asked me to come to the gas station. <laughs> what, are you crazy? I said. But he assured me that the cops were there with him. Then he dropped a bomb. The FBI were also in town, and they were going to talk to me one way or another, so I might as well come in. It was about 7.15, and I wanted to go back to bed, but I figured I wouldn't be able to sleep much more anyway, so I went down. Four men in suits greeted me and told me to have a seat. We went over everything two or three times until they got all the details down. Oh no. I told them about Jeremy, the security tape, last night at work. Everything. Finally, after I finished, one of the agents said, Oh Christ, we got another one on our hands. And then they made me sign a bunch of papers saying I wouldn't tell anyone about what happened. But I can't say much more. I might be breaking the law just by posting this. Oh, so we got... <laughs> so it turns out, the twist at the end is, this is an SCP Foundation video. Or this is an SCP article. <laughs> right. Oh, see ya, Isaac. Well, thank you for popping in, as he said. No, popping it. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm home. I'm not sure what to do with myself. That agent's words when I told him the story are going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Anyway, I've got to go. I have some errands to run today, and then I have to go into work to pick up some tapes. Oh, My no. boss and I think this new guy, Jeremy, he's a complete creep, is stealing motor oil, and I have to watch the security footage to see if I can catch him doing it. I have better things to do, but my boss is paying me overtime under the table, and I'm trying to save up for vacation so I could really use the money. It should be pretty simple. The oil always goes missing right after his shifts. I figure I'll just watch the tapes, catch him in the act, and that will be that. All right. So, I mean that that was interesting. I wouldn't say it was the best of the night, but it was it was pretty. It was all right. It's a good concept. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I think this guy might just be a JoJo villain. It's possible. It's entirely possible. Anyway, uh, I reckon that'll be it for tonight. What else did we have left on the wheel? The four things we had, or the three things we had left were Suicide Mouse, Insanity, and uh, Abandoned by Disney. <laughs> we dodged some bullets there, it seems. <laughs> Oh, but there's always next year. Oh, indeed. <laughs> or a Monday night. <laughs> yeah. We didn't really if you were so inclined. It wasn't it wasn't exactly bustling tonight, and I expect it to be even less so that night, but That's I'm not fair. gonna I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say no exactly, but I I I think maybe this one would probably be good enough for now. Right. Anyway. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you yep, for having you, me. You too. And uh, this uh, is me signing off. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>